That's coming up in the 9 o'clock hour. In this segment now, we welcome in the Speaker of the House of Delegates in West Virginia, Roger Hanshaw. Speaker Hanshaw, good morning to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us today. Gentlemen, good morning. Thanks for having me again. We are just a couple of days away from the beginning of the next legislative session and the final year of the governor's term in office. And, of course, this will reshuffle the deck with everybody in the House of Delegates, too, because of those two-year terms. And you'll all be greeted by what may be, indeed, a snowstorm this weekend <laughs> on the way to Charleston. Uh, Roger, for the, for the first day, uh, have you been uh, hearing folks uh, maybe coming in early because of that? Well, we all we will all assemble, Rob, on, on Sunday, actually. So our, our, our monthly interim meeting for January this month is the three days immediately preceding the opening day on Wednesday. So most folks will make their way into town here Saturday night and Sunday morning. Very good. As uh, you return, uh, the numbers right now for Republicans in the House, Roger, is it 89 or is it 90? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's 89. 89. Very yeah, good. We're, we're at 89 right here. Um, you're just just getting ready to to head in and do what do what we do every year. It's it's uh, it's 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 the the time we gather every year to do a lot of a lot of just yearly cleanup work, a lot of yearly preparation. Of course, the number one thing that we always do each year is the one constitutional requirement that the legislature has, which is to pass a budget and send to the governor for operation of the state in the, the upcoming fiscal year. So uh, we're, we're expecting the governor to introduce that budget on Wednesday night when he delivers his state of the state address to us. And then we'll, we'll get going on that Thursday morning with his budget presentation to our finance committees. And just just resume the, the people's business for 60 straight days. Republicans have been able to pass a budget in a timely fashion, uh, I think, ever since you took the majority. Uh, that was not always the case under Democratic majorities. I'm not looking for criticism of Democrats here, but uh, rather maybe you could tell me what the uh, secret has been to the efficiencies of the Republican majority to getting a budget passed on time. Well, it's more procedural than anything else, Rob. So the way that budget process comes together for those who haven't necessarily spent time here working in it is that the, the budget is typically among the very last things done by the legislature each year. And there's a, there's a necessity for that. The reason that's true is that all of the things done by the legislature each year, all of the programs enacted or or repealed or modified in some way all of the spending decisions that get made any kind of pay raises that get done all those things have to be accounted for in the budget for the upcoming fiscal year. So it's it's common for us to hear people from around the state say, well, you should pass the budget on, on the opening week. That should be the first thing you do. That that's That sounds that that sounds correct, but in reality, it doesn't work like that because the budget has to take into account all of the other things that the people ask us to deal with and take into consideration during the 60 days each year that we're here. So the reason that we have, have just decided more than anything else to pass that budget within the 60 days of the regular legislative session for each of the past several years is that we've, we've just made a commitment to wrap up the other substantive work of the body in time to incorporate those things into the budget. That, that wasn't always the case, and that, that was more just a management philosophy decision than anything else. But there is a procedural reason why we do it the way we do it now, and it, it's just all about prioritizing completing the other substantive work in time to do it by day 60. As you begin a new year here, it's not a new government year, but a new calendar year. How are the state's finances coming out of December heading into the month of January now? Well, they're they're still actually quite strong, and and we're we're very proud of that. So we we, uh, we we're we're on track to have another substantial budget surplus as we as we head into the second half here of of the current fiscal year. That's a good thing because it allows us to make capital investments in in other long overdue spending priorities that that we have around the state, the paving of roads and 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 expanding water and sewer projects to homes to people who who need those things. Uh, we we've been able to do that, Rob Bill with with the income tax reduction cut that was made by the legislature last year that, that Governor Justice championed. And uh, that, that's we're particularly proud of that, because even in light of a 21 percent reduction in, in the state's income taxes for, for the fiscal year, we're still seeing 
the we're still seeing substantial and comfortable budget surpluses, and that that's that's a validation of of what we had hoped to happen, which was that growth would happen as a result of changes that have been made and that we would begin to see a broadening of the tax base with more taxpayers paying into the overall contribution pie so that we could lessen the burden on each individual taxpayer. December numbers were plus 120 million on the uh, surplus side so it's 406 million for the year now and that's right and uh, I, I know you want that uh, that 10 percent uh, tax additional tax cut at some point along the year and i understand that that as eric kalsoder has told us is pretty much a mathematics thing if the numbers add up it kicks in if it doesn't add up then it's not necessarily the full 10 percent, but it could be less than 10 percent. correct yeah, it's a it's a pure mathematical exercise at this point. So this the the arrangement that was enacted into law last year was was all based on math, all based on numbers. It's a very objective process. There's no there's no subjectivity about it. There's no there, there's no uh, well should we do it? Should we not? It, it's an automatic process that the tax department can implement if numbers if numbers meet certain metrics within that statute. So it's it's no longer it's no longer something that's subject to to whim or caprice it's it's a purely mathematical exercise by the way uh roger if you have any hvac issues uh give eric a call he did mine at my house and did a smashing job i might add well, I'd be happy to do that. It is it is quite a haul from Martinsburg to uh, to Wallback, where my HVAC <laughs> unit sits. But uh, maybe maybe while he's passing down on the way to to Charleston next time, Bill. Uh, good morning, Mr. Speaker, and thanks so much for helping to start off the new year by being on the show. We always appreciate uh, always appreciate it. Uh, uh, Roger, we hear so much about the session once it's, once it begins, but I suspect there's a lot of preparatory work that goes into it. Would you fairly quickly describe some of the work that you're doing? One, how certain bills are identified, how the proposed bills will be prioritized, what's the mechanism for making that happen, and so forth. Uh, sure, I'm happy to. So there's 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 a, a a fairly standard way that gets done every year, and where the legislature begins is very often right where it left off the previous session, and we don't normally wait. 10 months to do that. So we'll, when, the, when the legislature adjourns most years in March, it doesn't convene again in regular session until the following January. But what the public often uh, doesn't know is that we meet those who choose to every month for for anywhere between two and three days each month to to begin preparing for the next upcoming regular session we call those interim meetings and they're usually held here in charleston but at least once a year or so we do we do go out to a different part of the state to let the members see things that are going on in, in the, the different geographic regions of West Virginia. During those interim meetings, our committees meet jointly, so they're House and Senate joint committees, most of them are, and those joint committees will meet and hear testimony on priority issues that came up during the legislative session that, for example, just didn't get finished. So perhaps on day 45 of the 60-day session, one of our committees identified a substantive issue where some work was needed or some some change needs to be made to the law but there wasn't time to get that done in the regular 60-day session our interim committees will spend the intervening months studying that issue and putting together a bill to address their finding and have it ready for introduction when we convene again the following january and then those bills get get processed and taken up and considered in the course of, of regular order during the regular session that's what what you'll see next Wednesday. So when we convene at, at noon on Wednesday the 10th, there'll be a substantial number of bills introduced that very day. And many of those will have grown out of our interim committee process. There'll be bills that that members and committees have drafted in response to things that came up or that were identified either during last year's regular session or in the intervening 10 months since we were here last. And we, we take those interim months to do that drafting and do that research. Uh, recently, the governor said he would like to see a 5 percent increase for teachers and state employees. Also, the PEIA has uh, recently raised their uh, their the rates contribution of about 14%. Will both of these items uh, get early attention? 
We're expecting the governor to call for that that increase for, for the public school employees and state workers in his State of the State address on Wednesday night, and we're expecting him to have included those items in his proposed budget that he'll introduce to us later that day or later that evening. We've had some dialogue with his administration leading up to the beginning of the session, April, and our understanding is that he is he is planning for that and that he does intend to introduce that, that kind of, of a raise to offset the PEIA increases and exceed it. Uh, we don't want to just we don't want to just offset someone's increased expenditures. We also want to give, to give them also an additional raise. We're expecting him to include those items in his in his budget. Okay, uh, the last year or so, there's been a lot of time devoted to the uh, uh, HHR, uh, especially child services protection, also corrections. Uh, are there and there's some loose ends uh, with both of these. Uh, how much time do you anticipate will be addressed in these two? Very important, but very separate items. Well, I can tell you there's been a substantial amount of time devoted to both of them in the intervening 10 months, Admiral. So you're, you're right to point out the, the, the ongoing issues in correction. So we, we took a big bite at that apple earlier or last year in 2023 when we were able to provide the salary enhancements for the uniformed correctional officers. But we at that time weren't able to take a step toward the non-uniformed personnel who also staff our facilities. That remains a priority for us. We, we do expect to, to spend some time on on those personnel also here during this upcoming regular session. And we, we've had a, a, a working group on the foster care and child protective services issues that's met at least once a month, and, and oftentimes they've been meeting much more frequently than once a month, alongside the executive branch here in the Capitol and, and at some remote meetings out around the state over the course of the past year. They've they've taken a couple different approaches. One one approach is is developing strategies that are intended to improve the communication flow between and among the the the, the foster parents, the child protective services workers, the judiciary, all of the parties involved in, in the child welfare system here in the state, because what we found is that that breakdown in communication is often at, at, the, at the heart of some of the, the horrific stories that you hear. We, we, we expect some kind of action during the session on that issue, whether that's administrative action or legislative action is a work in progress, but we do expect some action on that here in these upcoming 60 days. A question that we, and I'm, excuse me, I'm kind of just shotgunning going through a whole series of issues, uh, and some of them are related, a lot of them are not related, uh, but the question that we ask our local legislators every time we spe uh, speak to them are two items, home rule for the county and locality pay. Do you think either one of these will have any chance of getting traction in the upcoming session? Well, so I'm a supporter of both those things, Admiral, and I'll tell you why. So I live right smack dab in the middle of West Virginia, right? I live in Clay County, which is just about as central as, as you get. So it's, it's quite common for me to go weeks at a time and never cross the border and leave the state of West Virginia. That, that's just not the reality if you live in Martinsburg, right? It's, it's just not. So the, the, the border is a much more fluid construct for 60% of West Virginians. Uh, the, the data tells us that 60% of our citizens live in a border, in a county that borders another state. So what that means is that the, the hard borders of our state are much more of a fluid construct than they perhaps might be for me living right smack dab in the middle of West Virginia. But I also know that, that we have an obligation as the state to be able to staff and recruit people to work in our facilities, and that might mean difficulties recruiting to the high the the, the high cost of living areas in our eastern counties. But it also might mean difficulty recruiting for some of our more economically distressed counties. So, for example, we have a facility in in McDowell County, West Virginia, which has which is one of our more economically struggling counties. They, they suffer the same kind of difficulty recruiting workers that our facilities suffer in Martinsburg. Now, for a totally different reason, but it's nevertheless a difficulty that they face. We, we ought to have some inherent flexibility in state government that allows the executive branch to do what it's necess to do what's necessary to be able to, to recruit to recruit workers. Um, 
I, I think the same kind of argument is is applicable to local government. So I, I, I personally represent three counties. I represent Clay, Calhoun, and Gilmer counties. In each one of those counties, Admiral, there is a single municipality incorporated. So in each of those counties, there's one incorporated municipality and one county government. We we ought to have more flexibility for those for, for, for those local counties and municipalities that want to try experimentation, that want to try some new approach to government to be able to make that decision and and do so voluntarily. Uh, maybe that means county city consolidation in some places. Maybe it means uh, municipality collaboration on provision of certain kinds of services. All, all those things ought to be the law. I I would support that 100. percent I'd champion that bill as as far as it can go. Um, I, I went so far once as to actually begin putting such a bill together. Um, Perhaps it's time to dust that back off. Yeah. Every year there seems to be a surprise, a, leg- uh, a bill that's proposed that we were not anticipated. Do you have some inkling of what some of the surprises this year may be? <laughs> well, if I did, I guess they wouldn't be surprises. Um, not to you, but the rest of us it would be. So. Oh, uh, no, no, I, I do not, Admiral, and I'll, I'll tell you specifically why. If, if, if we could go back to the beginning of this segment today what we what we began talking about today was the fact that we are still running a budget surplus in West Virginia even after a 21.25% tax cut last year what that tells me is that what what the state of West Virginia is doing is working the things that we have put in place the the cooperation that we're seeing now between the state government the private sector counties cities boards of education the, the 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 things we are doing in West Virginia right now are working, and we just need to give them time to continue working so that we can improve upon the the problems that we found, but nevertheless continue to let the good things work. Sometimes sometimes what's necessary is that we let the cake bake a little longer, right? And I'm I view this as one of those years. I'd like to let us continue to see what our budget surpluses look like, so we can realize the next leg in that tax cut so that we can see the next trigger come into play. Um, you're, you're right. There are always things that happen during the course of the 60 days that the members are together that no one's anticipated. I'm, I'm confident there'll they'll, they'll be just as much a likelihood of that this year as ever. But as we sit here today on, uh, on January the 3rd, I couldn't tell you what that would be. Okay. One of the uh, – uh my observation is that over the years, there's not been the communication that we have today. Uh, and I really I very much appreciate that you're willing to come on and talk. Uh, the leadership of the Senate has done the same thing. Our local representatives have been very open as well. Uh, this all leads to, to my way of thinking, a deeper appreciation and a deeper respect for the government than what we would have with if there was a, more of an absence of, of the communication. So I'd like to commend you and your colleagues being as open as what you have been and what you are. Well, thank you, Admiral. That's kind of you to say. I mean, we, 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 we're a citizen legislature, right? I, I take that very seriously. We are, all, we are all part-time legislators. Every one of us have other jobs and do other things. And the time that we spend here in the Capitol is meant to be part-time. We're meant to be, we're meant to be out among our, our neighbors and friends and colleagues and coworkers and people we sit beside of at church and see in the gas station. And that's, that's how most of us get our ideas for public service. Roger Hanch, our guest here, Speaker of the House in uh, West Virginia's House of Delegates. Uh, Moore Capito, running for governor, has resigned as the uh, Judiciary Chairman and will concentrate on his election possibilities. How do you replace Moore Capito in the Judiciary Committee, Roger? Well, so Moore Capito's vacancy is one of, I believe, it's seven vacancies. Rob, that we're going to have, that we have either already filled or will have filled between now and the time we convene next, uh, next Wednesday. It's, it's been a year of, of turnover for the membership here in the House. Uh, we, we have, we have Moore's vacancy or, or Delgado Capito's former Douglas Capito's vacancy in the chairmanship of judiciary to fill. We also have uh, Delegate Charlie Reynolds, who resigned earlier this year to take a, take a position to, to, to do a job change. Uh, he was vice chairman of our Committee on Workforce Development. 
So we, we have some leadership changes to announce. We'll probably announce them all collectively in a, in a joint press release later this week. I'm not prepared to do it this morning. I understand that. Can some of that be, in Moore's case, uh, Tom Fast was the uh, deputy chair. Can, is it as simple as promoting the next person in line in some cases, or is it more thorough than that, Roger? Well, it, it's certain. So there, there's no there's no requirement. Obviously, let's start with that. There's no requirement that it that it be the vice chairman. But certainly, Delegate Fast is uh, is a long tenured member of our body here. He and I came into the House together in the 2014 election. Tom's a lawyer with with a long history of private practice. So he's he's certainly more than qualified to take the position. As you go into this final year of the governor's term, uh, you are in place. Craig Blair is in place as the Senate president and the governor is in place. Does that lead to a more efficient final year of a governor's term? Well, I don't know. Uh, that that's uh, every every governor is different, and every 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 governor approaches his or her responsibilities in a different way. I can tell you that our approach as the legislature to to the administration of the government isn't isn't different and won't be different. So at the, at the moment, we have what I consider a very workable structure put in place here. Rob, at, at least once a week during the course of the year. Uh, Senate President Blair and I, as long as as well as the governor's office, the, usually it's the governor's chief of staff. We we meet weekly to take up issues that are going on around the government, things that are happening in in each of the branches of government that require either immediate or or longer term attention. So we're we're going to continue doing that. Uh, we, we, that that's important to us. We think it's a necessary. Almost, a, almost a prerequisite to efficient management of this government. We're, we'll continue to do that right up until, well, well, in perpetuity. That's 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 just our approach. Thank you so much for your time this morning, Roger. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Roger. Okay, gentlemen, have a good day. You too.